All right. Uh, good evening, guys. We're live on Facebook. Good to see you. Thank you, Rich. Oh, sorry. Now it's gone. All right. We're live on Facebook. Good evening, guys. I, uh, good to see you guys. Sorry. I don't know what's going on. It's okay. All right. Now. Oh, yeah. All right, and we are recording. We're recording live on Facebook and on Zoom. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Good evening, guys. Good to see you guys. Uh, lots going on, lots to talk about. Good to see you. Hi, everyone. Uh, hey, how are you guys? It's been a while since we've been doing this. I uh, hope it doesn't show too much. Anyway, um, you know, <laughs> good to yeah. see you guys even digitally. I know there's a lot to talk about, so I'll uh, step out of the way. But uh, let's just touch in real quick. How are either both of you guys? We're we're a little bit older. That's <laughs> that is that is definitely uh, yeah. definitely something that's uh, ha happened to us this past week. Uh, David, happy birthday! Happy birthday to you, man! Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. We essentially share a birthday. So yeah, yeah, a cool. day apart. Um, but that 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 aside, I'm good. I'm just you know working and uh, trying to uh, navigate. Uh, personally, I, yeah, I feel like, you know, our worlds have turned upside down in the past few months that we haven't, you know, our Arch Media was, our last broadcast was, you know, a little close was, to two months ago. Yeah. Um, and a lot has happened to Armenia, to the world. Um, and we, uh, we apologize if we haven't been kind of up to date on uh, trying to spotlight but my personal world is that i don't know sometimes i wake up and i'm in agony sometimes i wake up and i see 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 the positive and possibility of moving forward but uh it, it nevertheless the most important thing is always to be educated and i've become like this uh you know this this talking head everywhere i go about what's going on in Artsakh and how important that region is to the survival of armenia in general um, I, nowadays I feel like a minority. I've never thought that that would be the case in my life. Okay. So, but it's a, you know, definitely I'm, I'm a, I'm a vocal minority because I've slowly am finding my people amongst the, the diaspora that seem to not want to shut up about it. And, uh, you know, hopefully things will turn around. I'll talk right. there. I'm pretty sure you got two other guys who are not willing to shut up about it. So that's true. That's true. That's true. But I'm not going to speak on your guys' behalf. So well, I, yeah. I appreciate that. So. But, you know, I got a really big mouth, and I'm uh, I was I'm fortunate to know how to use it. So at least yeah, I think we, I do. We got yeah. we got uh, yeah lots to to share. Like Lane, and you're absolutely right, Greg. It's important that we continue to inform uh, our friends, our family, acquaintances, coworkers. You know, yeah, and uh, but shout out to everyone that, you know, from time to time, I don't know, I don't have the pulse on who is listening to us. I know some people that do. And if you see me yeah. in certain settings and you guys decide to kind of reach out and say, hey, thanks, I listened to this and that on Arash Media, you know, thank you. I hope Definitely. I hope we are giving you a little bit of a service um, and we are uh, essentially explaining this nightmare that we're going through. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, you know, it feels like it's being normalized, but it's nothing that's happening to Armenia is normal. Right. Uh, nothing that's happening to Artsakh is normal. And uh, I oftentimes have a hard time explaining what's happening in Armenia to non-Armenians, uh, because a lot of the things that are happening to Armenia are actually being driven by Armenians and then being sold to us as this is not our fault. This just happened to us. That's right. how I see it these days. Right. Okay. Um, and it's a well, very, very, it's a very cheap way of selling something. Back right. to you guys. Okay. Well, listen, Greg uh, and Rich, we got 14 people live watching us tonight, which Thank is you. amazing. Shout out to uh, Mrs. Anna Aspat Turian Turcot. She's uh, one of them watching. Thanks for tuning in, Anna. Uh, and uh, why don't we get into the news and what's and, going and, on? Yeah, Anna's always doing doing big things, and uh, I look forward to seeing her. What's 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 next in in, in her for for her foundation because. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyways, there's well, a lot. I, you know, if I, if I may, I'd like to just level set a little bit about what we're going to talk about tonight. We have Please. Uh, the past few months have seen a lot of action globally. Obviously, the big news uh, in, in everyone's mind and on everyone's plate, so to speak, uh, is what's happening between Russia and, the, and Ukraine. It's all over the news. It's been all over every media uh, outlet that I've been able to pay attention to. And um, so Obviously, we're going to talk a little bit about that, but there's a lot more happening in Artsakh that everybody needs to know about. And there's some things happening in Armenia that we need to know about. Now, in the context of this next you know, hour or so, we don't have, there literally is not enough time to, to cover everything. And we might not even be able to put everything in the links uh, in this feed for you to you know, see. Um, 
but we will do our best to get as much news out to you as possible. And there are plenty of news sources to pay attention to. So for tonight, um, obviously we're gonna talk a little bit about Russia, Ukraine and how it affects Armenia and Artsakh. Um, but where do you guys wanna start? You wanna start with Artsakh or do we wanna start with Armenia? Let, I, let's start with Ukraine, right? Like Ukraine. we talked about okay. Ukraine, right? Yeah. 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 Fair enough. Um, so going on two months, right? For that war. Uh, it's coming in on six weeks today is what yeah. the what, uh, the American media is saying. Um, suddenly, right. um, so since our last broadcast, obviously the world already knows, no need to kind of go into it, is that Russia and Ukraine are like a full-scale blow-up uh, war uh, predominantly led by Russia, um, of course, and uh, now the whole world seems to be, be is asked to take sides on this matter. Uh, humanitarian crisis uh, is kind of ensuing, definitely affects Armenia as well, because we are, we're our arch media, we, we see everything from the Armenian perspective, you know, um, not to de belittle the humanitarian crisis that is happening in Ukraine, millions of uh, uh, internally displaced and are now kind of seeping over into uh, Eastern Europe, Poland, I believe alone took in a million to two million uh, refugees. Yeah. Um, and then there's also more. refugees coming from the Eastern side of Ukraine as well that the Western media never covers. And that these are the, the people in Donbass region that are also fleeing into Russia as well. Um, so Today's Armenia is also Armenia seeing an influx of both Russians and Ukrainians coming into Yerevan as a way to kind of see uh, uh, a little bit of a, uh, you know, uh, like a safe rate, a safe haven from the destabilization in the area. Why? Because those both countries have visa free entries into Armenia and Armenia has a very good link through us, the diaspora, uh, to the West. Um, so that's kind of what what is going on in a nutshell. It is an um, you know, Russia is being, uh, what do you call it, uh, embargoed, of course, and also is being sanctioned heavily. Um, in my opinion, it's the kind of sanctions I haven't seen levied on a country uh, ever, actually. That's, and that's not my opinion. The, there's, a, it's, you know, economists everywhere are saying these, these are kind of one of the most cutthroat sanctions we've ever seen. Um, and the country is, uh, Putin is responding uh, with, with his countermeasures. Um, what else can we say about what's going on? We, the, we thought it was going to be a swift, uh, swift uh, uh, process in terms of what uh, Putin wants to do in Ukraine, right? And the reason why he attacked, at least on paper, the way he says, is he wants to make sure that Ukraine never considers entering uh, NATO uh, because that is Putin's red line. Um, for those of you that don't know what Ukraine stands for, Russia... I really, you know, implore everyone to listen, uh, look into like the, the history books. There's a lot of Wikipedia pages we can post about what is the kind of interplay between Russia and Ukraine, how brotherly those two nations are. Um, and we can have a full deep dive on why we think today happened the way it happened after 2014. That was a first kind of, uh, uh, you know, Maidan and the taking of Crimea and and the eastern section but and then we can also talk about what ukraine is because suddenly everybody knows what what the hell ukraine is without even understanding what what, what the word ukraine means and what is the genetic makeup of ukraine we as armenians and i'll stop my monologue we as armenians know that there's two hundred thousand plus armenians living all across the regions in in ukraine um the, the armenian diaspora in ukraine is both modern and ancient in the west it's very ancient in the, the city of Lviv and in Donbass it's uh, it's a very very uh very new it's like the, the from, from the time of Soviet Union and onwards a lot of Armenians from Baku and the atrocities committed to our towards Armenians in Azerbaijan escaped via Yerevan and even sometimes directly to Ukraine um seeing it as a bigger more um a uh, country with more opportunities for refugees, right? So there is that community there as well. Um, so it's a, it's a very horrible situation. Uh, yeah, I mean, we lived through it with Artsakh and the aggression from Azerbaijan, right, against the Armenians of Artsakh. And now we're seeing all that aggression of Russia against Ukraine for the very reasons you, you identified, Greg. And thank you for all the context and the history of the Armenian population there. Mm -hmm. Let's touch on let's touch on briefly how yes, how yes. this is impacting Armenia proper, 
and Artsov, because right. remember, there are peacekeepers that are ensuring the safety of Artsov, which we'll get yeah. to in a moment. Uh, but we're seeing, we saw the Dram plummet, but now kind of come back a little bit, right? Because of how closely the Dram is tied to the ruble. Uh, yeah. We've seen fights in the parliament of Armenia yes. uh, between Pashinyan and parliamentarians, members of parliament, yes. about how are we going to secure grain? Because Artsakh was the breadbasket of Armenia. Now mm -hmm. we don't have Artsakh anymore. Yeah, and good, we're dependent good, on Russia good. for grain. Anyway, yes. Richard, you were going to say something real quick, but. Well, I was just going to say, you know, I mean, the, the, and I want to make this brief. Uh, even more than what all the things that you laid out, Greg, there's more at, at play going on here. I would I would venture to say that, that most countries and most uh, communities have a generational knowledge and a generational uh, perspective. You know, Armenians have a generational perspective forged through the genocide and, uh, and, and it, many other events. So does Russia. And so it's more than um, just, you know, the, the demographics and what makes up these countries and some of their relationships. It's also about Russia responding to NATO. It's, 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 uh, it's important to remember that, you know, and I, first of all, I'll be, I, I'm not an, a Putin apologist, um, but I also respect what he's done for Artsakh and Armenia right now. And so I personally, I can't speak for anybody else, but I have to walk a line about my criticism and how, uh, how, how much is worth the disclosing. But I would say this, um, you know, Russia has a history of being, you know, um, betrayed by many countries, uh, Germany, obviously, uh, the, the West, uh, France, many other countries. If you look throughout history, uh, you know, Russia- Tur Tur Turkey is a big one. Turkey is a big one too. For sure. But my point is, is that, is that, um, you know, since the wall fell, many of these countries never gave Russia the opportunity in, in earnest to join the, the community at large and sort of, they want to do business with them, but you can, well, we're still going to block you in a bunch of different ways. And, and so to suggest, not that anybody did here, but for the world to suggest that, that, um, that, they should be able to put NATO and missiles from NATO and troops by NATO so close to the Russian border. Um, I mean, if I were Putin, I'd be pretty irritated too. So, so you know, I mean, I, and, yeah. I, and I don't want to do a deep dive on that dynamic. I just wanted to, to, to add to what you were saying that there, there's absolutely. a lot going on. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so again, for those that are viewing, I uh, uh, touch up on a couple of points with, with David and, and, and what you said, Rich. Um, number one, um, there are closer NATO uh, uh, countries to Moscow than the Ukraine. Uh, for example, uh, Estonia is NATO, and it's literally right. 60 miles away from St. Petersburg. Um, however, the thing with uh, Ukraine is this is where Russia's heartland and the beginning of Russia's history started in Kiev. Not that Ukraine gave birth to Russia, but Kiev and Russia which is the, the Russian heartland, began in Ukraine, okay, and what today is Ukraine. So th there's a historic red line for Russia there that the United States simply doesn't, and the West did not care about. They were very careless with Putin in this particular country. Well, not so much care them. about, you know, the, Putin would not put that red line with us, Armenians and Artsakh, we know that. Um, uh, Estonia and the Baltic states were a problem, but he did not say anything. But this was his red line, and the United States and Brussels could not care less. And this right. is where we are now. Not to say that they caused it, but definitely they, no one exactly sure. tried to defuse that bomb either. Okay? Not at all. So, not at yeah. all. Yeah. And to David's uh, point, right. yes, Armenians are now and forever into eternity are going to start feeling what we are losing with the loss of land in Artsakh. Artsakh was our breadbasket. Artsakh was our water supply. Okay? And if you do not open up your books and maps and look into the uh, uh, look into understanding what Artsakh was for Armenia, only Monte Melkonyan said it best. Like if we lose Artsakh, it will be the end of Armenia. And the fact that Yerevan and Pashinyan still don't understand that. I mean, there are people out there that say that he's an agent of this, this and that. I happen to agree, but that is not the, the argument I want to bring forth right now. Um, it's just again and again, in dire situations, we were self-sufficient in a lot of ways. And now we are going to be beholden to everything. And as a matter of fact, when we open up to Turkey and integrate our economies, we're going to be even more beholden to, to our enemies because now you won't be able to have potatoes 
unless you buy them from Turkish markets. That's right. That's it. All right. Let's let's, right. let's, let's roll in. So yeah, I think that there's probably some good overview of of where Ukraine is and, and the war there and how it relates to Armenia and Artsakh, right, guys? Is there anything else we want to touch on on that right now? I mean, it's it, it 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 well a, a major point. Sorry, a major point yeah. and. Uh, uh, Rich, you and, uh, and and David and I have talking, talk, talked about it, and there's no, no article that describes it, but we also noticed the world's response, and I'm talking about the world, not just the Western world, right. response to the hypocrisy and the way that we're seeing this uh, uh, issue unfold, as especially as Armenians, where I'm being asked, I have a lot of, you know, Eastern European friends, and they're always kind of asking me like, well, well, this and this and that, Ukraine, this and this and that, and I'm like, well, you know what, as an Armenian, um, I really didn't see the outcry or the any kind of a uh, you know cry on my shoulder about what happened with Artsakh, and now I'm supposed to respond to Ukraine like David and Richard and I said, and RH Media stands by what we say: it is a humanitarian catastrophe, and wars are such. But my heart, first and foremost, goes out to Armenians in Artsakh. My heart goes out to all the Syrian brother and sisters that went through all they did, the way that we backstabbed Kurds and all the humanitarian issue there. Everything that's happening from Palestine all the way down to Yemen, and then the entire world does not give a damn. There's a genocide currently going on in the east of uh, Ethiopia. Why can't we have the ability to highlight all of them? That way we can also be very, very cognizant of what's happening to the plight of the well, European I think, I Eastern Europe. It think seems to me right. right now we can only care about Ukraine, and that's what's being asked of me. For sure. Right. For well, sure well said, I think well you could, I think you answered your own question, Greg. I think, you know, that in many ways, and, I, and I, I'll just leave, put my two, two, two cents in. I, it has been really, re I can't, I don't know what anybody else has gone through. And I don't know what the, the, our viewers have, have, have experienced. But if they're anything like what, what I think we are, and I know I am, it has been really, really hard and really triggering for me to hear anything about Ukraine because. I remember listening to what happened and broadcasting with 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 you both on this when it was happening. I remember going through it and nobody caring. I remember broadcasting myself just going, can somebody listen? Can somebody call a senator? Can somebody do help out in any way? And it was crickets. Oh, well, I don't even know, I don't even know how to pronounce it. So I'm not even going to get involved. But now everybody and their sister-in-law has a Ukrainian flag on their Facebook profile. And, every, and I'm seeing big, huge American trucks with Ukrainian flags on the back. And, you know, it is, like you said, Greg, um, I have, an absolutely un, unquenchable well of empathy for anybody who's suffering. Even the people who live in the country that helped bomb us, that helped with white phosphor bombs. I, I, I will concede that maybe not everybody was behind that because they're people just like the rest of us, subject to whatever their government is doing. But I have to tell you, it's really insulting to have someone call me up or text me or see me face to face and say, what do you think about this? Well, I don't know. What did you think about everything I was trying to talk about for the past few years? No, I mean, you I know, mean clearly. It's um, frustrating. And, right. And, the, and the, the, the level of frustration is now also a little bit sensitive here. So here's what I will say. And we can also kind of get past this. So this is us Armenians, right? And there's also the, the rest of the world that it's in complete agony. Just one, for example, just one. Do you notice how crazy the actual escape of the refugees into Eastern Europe was where people of color were actually not allowed, where it was always like a safe passage for Ukrainians. So there was that catastrophe that was like, spotlighted to us where you're like oh my god so it's just like just the ukrainians are allowed to to go uh, of a certain skin color right uh, yeah. a nigerian student stuck behind indian students stuck behind yeah. one kid walked into russian uh territory so that he could just at least get out of anywhere you know like the stories were insane right um and then finally as armenians we are all over the world, right? And we sometimes put on the skin of the individual countries that we live in. So this is my message to all the American uh, blue-blooded Armenians. Uh, this is not our fight, okay? And Armenia does have a lot of things to lose if this goes really, 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 really sour for Russia. I said it. Does it make me feel good? I don't care what it makes me feel like. It's just sometimes in the in the world we live in, you have to just be an adult and not an opportunistic, uh, philosophical, uh, uh, you know, like, um, you know, just a you know thought machine. 
In reality, if tomorrow Moscow is pummeled, Artsakh and everything that we have is pummeled with it. So right. do as you may with that knowledge, my dear Armenians in the Western diaspora, okay? You can call me Putin apologist, although I'm not. I can tell you everything that I know that's evil about that individual. But I can also tell you that there's 100,000 Armenians living in Artsakh right now, okay? And Russian peacekeepers are standing somewhat guard with that. I don't see United Nations. And to all the Armenians out there that have suggested to me that NATO should come and, uh, and uh, uh, well, guess which NATO, who's the, the first NATO nation that can come to Artsakh that's the closest? It's Turkey. Turkey. I wonder what they will do once they come to uh, uh, help uh, uh, Artsakh. Or uh, they already have bases in Shushi. They already exactly. Bases in Shushi. Exactly. So, exactly. Yeah. Look, guy, yeah. Look, guys, you know, it, it's it's very difficult for us Armenians, especially for us Armenians that that understand this geopolitical conflict that we're discussing. Uh, but yes, Artsakh uh, and the safety of the Armenians that live there right now is in the hands of Russian peacekeepers, where they're adding more. And we'll get to that in a moment. They're supposedly adding more peacekeepers because there's a need to now, which we'll get to. Maybe that's a good maybe this is a good segue to to touch on everything that's going on in Artsakh. Yeah, perhaps. Yeah. All right, I'm opening up the links chart right now. So, um, oh, yeah. David, you put together a pretty good timeline, and so let's. Let, mm -hmm. uh, do, you, do you want to start with that? Yeah, well, uh, we probably should go back uh, to March seven, right, Greg, where there was yeah. one soldier that was killed and another wounded uh, from a Zeri shelling that started. Then, uh, so, the Askaron region continues to come under heavy fire, uh, so, and yeah, so. So, I mean, as soon as the things happen in uh, in 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 Ukraine, my mind immediately went that these a-holes are going to utilize this opportunity to start something in uh, uh, with with Artsakh. And immediately, you uh, obviously, we now have a lot of friends that are on the ground there. One person in particular will highlight him that literally, you know, corroborate with everything that we see. Yes, there was there was shelling that immediately started, you know, let's call it a few days later, they were assessing their options, right? Um, and yeah, Azerbaijan uh, started to kind of penetrate into Askeran. Askeran is that central kind of segue in making statements. Uh, and I'm sorry, I'm just going beyond this article, uh, such as, you know, Armenians, please leave. You have X, Y, Z hours before we will attack. Uh, eventually they do. Um, they do a bunch of times. They do from different angles. Uh, I'm sure all those links will, will corroborate with that. And as you, if you were Armenian, you have been kind of going through the Instagram and your Facebook timeline, seeing those things uh, happen. So yes, our, uh, Azerbaijan completely took, uh, uh, and these are not just like little skirmishes. Uh, there were like dozens of Azeri soldiers were uh, killed and wounded. Dozens of Armenian soldiers were wounded. And right. a, a few, four Armenian soldiers, as well as this one Armenian soldiers uh, were murdered. And these are people, by the way, when you read their stories, uh, these are people that, were through the war in 2020. One guy was, uh, you know, a teenager during the 1992 war. Okay, um, and they've survived all that to be murdered now. Right. This is kind of what I want us as yeah. Armenians to be focused on. I'm sorry, this is seems selfish. Maybe when we're living in a global world, that's the only thing that I can. But you know, about. but but Greg, we have to be. We have to be because here's part of the deal. The part of the deal is, is that the Western media doesn't want to inflame other stories. In other words, they don't want to portray other stories because they don't want people to get the idea that this is the beginning of World War III. But the reality is, is that there are people who are taking advantage of this situation and kickstarting something. And no one is, pay I, I haven't seen anybody paying attention to it. In other words, like nobody's it. stopping them. Exactly. So, as a matter of fact, right, David, uh, as, uh, as the war in arts, as the as the story or the news idea of amplify all conflicts has been kind of trending because uh, people from Ethiopia, like us to Yemen, seven years in a catastrophic uh, 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 fighting in, in that country with with droughts and famine all over the place. And again, Armenia gets hit. We were thinking, well, okay, now would be a time that maybe we'll get, you know, shout out to Popular Front, which is a very fringe uh, news organization. The only place that I saw say something about the uh, ongoing uh, skirmishes that Azerbaijan is inflicting against uh, uh, Artsakh. Yeah. You can see it happening right here. Yes. Yeah, there, there, yes. There's our favorite map, right? Um, favorite uh, in 
parentheses. I would say most used. Yes. Yeah. Um, the the I guess we should kind of fast forward to the next major news item that's ongoing as as a, 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 is a more of a humanitarian crisis, compounded also with with actual skirmishes and strikes with the loss of land. Right. Um, that is the closing of the gas pipeline. This is now considered what you call an economic blockade and the terrorization of a peaceful population. Okay. Um, so it started March 8th, right? There was March 8th, International Women's Day. Right. Um, and then we, we kind of, you know, there was that uproar that Armenians did whatever. Some, some Congress people here and there noticed that, of course, from the Armenian caucus. No one, how dare somebody else care about this? Um, and then apparently it was solved. Right, they said we'll we'll fix it. They start fixing it, and then but then, again, but then apparently they turn on. They all they did was they put in an, a, a turn on off switch into a valve. Essentially, this was all Artsakh, and that gas pipeline is essentially running through a piece of land that is now in Shushi, controlled by the you know the 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 goblins as we would like to call them. Um, and uh, you know, as such, they were able to. Uh, um, terrorize and freeze an Armenian population in the dead of winter. Okay. Yeah, I, I, still very cold there. Yeah. I don't, I don't, man, I don't even understand. Yeah, so then it, they, 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 re, they repaired it or resume gas and then again, shut it off March 22nd. Yeah. Yes. And then we've yeah. seen more aggression between March 22nd and now uh, yesterday uh, where uh, the we, situation still remains. Right. We here have already stopped speculating, right? And there's a couple other news items today that'll talk to that about, you know, United States spending on our Azerbaijan versus Armenia. Um, where I, the world blatantly, the world organizations blatantly do not care about the loss of Armenian life. They do not care. And that was evident in one thing. Gas turned on, turned off, turned on, turned off. Armenian babies freezing, skirmishes, murder of Armenian soldiers. United Nations goes to Shushi to celebrate 30 years of Azerbaijan's, uh, what do you call it, uh, induction into the United Nations. Yep. Azerbaijan turns on gas, or I believe within that same time frame, even as soon as they leave, turns off the gas, or even, I think, they don't even care anymore. It was off while the United Nations was there. There is absolutely, and I don't understand. Right, and Armenia and Arsenal no. have blasted the UN for that. They've blasted the UN for that. I, I, I just okay, cool, thank to, you. We're, we're, we're going to have to, at some point, get right with the fact that that's not going to change, right? It, it's would, not. And, yes. and so if we continue to waste our energy saying, oh, how come nobody pays attention to us? Um, we're, we're only going to be siphoning off what energy that we have that we could dedicate to other things. And yeah. You know, I mean, I, I'm not calling for anything. I would certainly not wish violence on anybody. But, you know, the idea that the Armenians have gone through this much and not been like the Palestinians and strapped bombs into their chest and, and marched into public squares I, 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 yeah, is nothing is a, short of a miracle. It's a radical thought, and this is something... Again, I wouldn't want that. I'm just no, saying that, um, you know... Yeah. Anyway, so, so let's get back to um, this one, which is... Yeah. Uh, so now, because of all this, uh, Russia is bringing in more more peacekeepers. Right. 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 And a, a piece of uh, a, a little injection into the a commentary on that. So uh, there was an incursion into Artsakh. Villages were taken. I believe one village is still not repopulated back with uh, what do you call it? This is again people that have been cut off from uh, uh, heating now had to flee their home into other places which have no heating as well. Um, uh, the Azeris took high grounds, Armenians retaliated. This is where the loss of four more Armenian soldiers is. Russians were able to then essentially uh, make sure that Azerbaijan falls back to the original position. And I believe as of today, they are still walking around uh, with loudspeakers telling Armenians that they need to leave. Yeah, and no, they, they still occupy the mountaintop. Um that yes. is in that village uh let's see the name of it uh karagluk does that yeah, sound right karagaluk karagaluk Karag which means yeah. the, the 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 head of the rock essentially yes um uh, so the situation there is still very tense uh, and the, and the soldiers the zeri soldiers still are occupying that that mountaintop yeah so when people ask oh you know how do we feel about what, what's going on in ukraine i would say well I, you know again 
what about what happened in Arkansas two two years ago, less than two years ago, and what's happening right now? And they go as and they matter phase of, out. As a matter of fact, I like to think that people are good people in general, right? But there's an overlap of a lot of the people that started to yell about Ukraine and the ones that could care less about Artsakh two years ago. There's sure. a big overlap there, the other, mean, a huge one. The yeah. other thing, so, guys, and we, we've alluded to it, but I'm going to explicitly say it if we haven't yet. Artsakh, excuse, Artsakh is under these attacks by Azerbaijan because of Russia's involvement in Ukraine. They're very much connected. Russia's busy. Okay, we're going to see what we can get away with. There's still peacekeepers there. I'm wonder I keep wondering how many are there now? How many have gone to Ukraine? How many uh how many can they possibly keep there? The Greek City Times article from 2 years ago, guys, is coming true. I hope it does not, but it, I keep bringing that up because can Russia defend Artsakh and engage in Ukraine? Can Russia they- just needs to be very threatening to Baku. And Armenians need to be given the power to uh, defend Artsakh. I believe we can do it ourselves. Okay, that's what I believe. That's the one of the biggest mysteries that I want the Amer- Armenian uh, nation to just kind of like lift the veil of BS, the fog in our heads. We've well, been sold so much BS about how the soldiers. You need to read the 1992 war and the struggle of how things went on then. Okay, everyone's like technology has evolved. BS, there was still a lot of crazy stuff going on back then and how we fought and uh, uh, liberated Artsakh versus all of a sudden now we're weak, we suck, our boys can't fight, we don't know how to fight, life is bad, drone, drone, drone. Part of it is true, but a lot of it is uh, uh, by design, okay? So, you know, I don't know enough about the inner workings of Putin and his his attachment to the caucuses and where he wants to project power. A lot of the things that we've been talking about is based on uh, our our understanding of geopolitics and our investigation of that um, and more. Um, But, you know, I guess one thing that comes up for me is I wonder if there is an ingredient, uh, you know, or at least the threat that if if things begin to go a little bit more south in, so to speak, with the Ukraine-Russia situation. At what point is Russia gonna expedite the, the conversations between Armenia uh, and Azerbaijan and Turkey to say, y'all need to normalize your stuff because I have other things to do besides protect you? Well, then that unfortunately is a lengthy conversation. And the only way that I can respond to that, Russia's foreign policy has always been a little uh, lopsided. And unfortunately, again, just like I will not defend Putin, I will underline that we are in this geopolitical conundrum. We don't have a second alternative. Everything that all the Armenians from the West keep thinking, and Pashinyan, that Turkey can be our friend, Azerbaijan will normalize and not want to murder the rest of Armenia, um, that the United Nations will help us, that NATO will help us, that Europe will help us, um, is nothing but drunken buffoonery, okay? We have Russia, we have Russia with a crazy Putin, and we have Russia with a very, very stupid foreign policy. They always seem that they're a little bit like two steps of two steps ahead of the Turk and the Turk always outdoes them. It happened in the Crimean War in the 19th century. It happened in the war of, uh, you know, uh, the Russo-Turkish War. Um, and it keeps on happening over and over and over. Ataturk did that to Lenin um, while we ro- lost all of Ani, Gars, and never, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Russia just does not learn. Um, look, at, look at what happened recently. Just to, again, the, to your question, Richard. Um, in uh, 2014, I believe, uh, a Russian ambassador in Ankara was murdered in, a, in an art gallery. In a, okay, point blank, a guy walks in, murders them. Um, And uh, what do you call it? And in Syria, uh, Turkish uh, missiles shot down a Russian uh, jet. I thought those would be, you know, enough for Russia to just snap. But somehow Russia always thinks that they can kind of play the field. They're the aggressive bear. And in reality, I think Russia is aging and slightly losing its uh, threat level over time, as well as people knowing that Russia will try to kind of find ways. Like, for example... Yeah, anyways, that's too so, yeah, so, so much. So I want to I want to make a pivot and then I want to uh, answer yeah. or at least bring up a, before before we continue on the news, 
we have had a viewer comment and I wanna address that really quick, quickly. So Sosie, just give me one, one second. Um, we talk a lot about Russia for obvious reasons, not just because of the Ukraine situation, but because of what they've done uh, with Armenia and Artsakh in the past couple of years, and of course our long history together. Um, but the other thing that we need to mention is, is that we are also surrounded by uh, by Turkey, of course, and also Iran. And um, my argument to many people is that what they don't understand about what's going on right now and how Armenia fits in it is that what we are experiencing is a resurgent Turkish power because of the intent to reestablish a caliphate. And part of that goal uh, or is to have more influence over the Islamic world. So if you think about it, there are three major powers, right? We've got Iran, we've got Turkey, and we've got the Saudis, right? And all of them are trying to project their own brand of Islamic power throughout the region. And so when Egypt we think to about- a lesser, Egypt to a lesser degree. Yeah, yeah sure, okay. But, but okay. Yeah, yeah, sure. yes, yes. But for the sake of this our, our argument, yes. we have those yeah, three yeah. that are really going at it, trying to really insert, you know, to affect, uh, you know, to become the preeminent Islamic state which is why Turkey was supporting IS, which is why they were hemorrhaging their border and letting people in and buying the oil to fund that whole op operation it was all Turkey. So, so you, you, what you have is this, this intent to create a new caliphate that stretches all the way into Asia, right? Um, that unifies all these Turkic countries and it puts Armenia right in the middle of it. And that's one of the reasons that they want to get rid of it because they, they see this as an opportunity to um, to finish what they started in, in in the original genocide. So the question came up: How how would Iran? Uh, how does Iran feel about uh, or how would Iran erect with a potential power shift in the area? So I guess my question to you, gentlemen, is: Number one, um, do you in any way agree with my assessment of those three major powers vying for influence? And what do you think about uh, what? Do we have any speculation about how Iran uh, feels or would feel if uh, Turkey had had more more juice in the area, so so to speak, or if Russia had less influence to moderate? Well, we don't need to answer the question. We could just go by the news item that I read today, which is we didn't bring up. Uh, Shushi was designated today uh, the uh, the cultural capital of the Turkic world, so not of Azerbaijan, not of Turkey but from Mongolia down to Istanbul, the capital of the cultural capital of the Turkic world is now Shushi. Now it's BS and if I was Mongolian or I don't know if I was, if I was from Kazakhstan, I think that's a joke, but in reality, it's again that, 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 that push forward. So that's an answer to any Armenian that's questioning, what do I think Iran is doing? Personally, I think Iran is doing enough and also not enough. What I'm saying is like, we've all heard that, that they said that they're gonna allow that uh, uh, Azerbaijan take its, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, reunification with Nakhichevan via corridor that will go through Iran, which was always the idea that was uh, possible. Because why? Because Iran can stomp a hole in Azerbaijan anytime it needs to, okay? And it can levy its taxes however it wants to, and that will be a way to alleviate their desire to take over Sunik. So that's good that they're doing that. Um, I know that Iran is afraid of being sucked into some bigger, uh, bigger uh, geopolitical warfare, especially with Israel always drumming up the, the West to just stomp a hole in Iran. Um, the West here being Turkey, of course. I think that uh, Iran is both wary and af afraid. However, did you not notice what happened? I wanna say, three weeks into the war in Ukraine, there was a humongous attack on the, uh, a, a missile strike by Iran on, uh, uh, what do you call it, on Iraqi Kurdistan. And uh, that's the Kurdistan inside of Iraq with the taking out of, I, th I think they, they even hit a, a couple of American sites. And that was Iran's way of saying, hey man, we're still around. We're still got, we got, we got, you know, tactical missiles and we're not afraid to use them. Um, so I don't know. I don't think Iran is being assertive enough, in my opinion, but it's always playing from the point of caution. It's weary right, well, of Turkey. I, yeah. The one thing that we've we've heard and seen them say, and perhaps we can move on, is that 
their red line is any change to the border, the Armenia southern border, any change to their borders, their border with Armenia and Sunik, which is what we know Azerbaijan and Turkey want. They want Sunik gone, so it's unified with Nahichevan and Azerbaijan, right? So Iran has said that that is their red line. Hopefully, we don't have to worry about that to begin with. And if we did, if we would only, time would have to tell us if right. Iran would even do anything. I'm, 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 I, I agree yeah. with you guys. Let's, yeah, I'm, let's, absolutely. Let's, let's push forward. Yeah. Okay. So perhaps we should touch on, uh, should, we, should we start talking about the U.S. and then the miscellaneous items and uh, and then we wrap? Or what do you guys right, think? Right, right. Absolutely. Uh, U.S., uh, Armenia, there's a couple of, yeah, there's a major, remember we, we mentioned there's like major, major uh, news items. There will be a meeting between Aliyev and Pashinyan. Oh, right. um in uh, co coming coming up in on i believe april 6th um what i understand in from Russia, there right. is this um armenia so everything we talk about we have we have the the, the pulse of the nation which is Artsakh, and we have and we have everything that's an anti-armenian in my humble opinion that's coming from uh you know the government in power right now what I mean by that is this, for example, what is Aliyev and Pashinyan going to do in uh, Brussels on April 6th? Um, there's been talks of Azerbaijan putting forth five points of what they want Armenia to do for Armenia's dream to come true, meaning Pashinyan's dream to come true is the quote unquote normalization of ties with Azerbaijan that is actively shelling Armenians, okay? So just, put, you know, Put your mind there that uh, Pashinyan is seeking good uh, uh, relations with a government that is actively erasing its existence and is murdering uh, citizens of, uh, of Artsakh, okay? And actually uh, shelling Armenia proper as well from Yerask in, in, in the south of uh, by Ararat Valley, okay? We forgot to mention that. Um, the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs in Armenia said that, uh, and I believe the, the Alan Simonyan, the, the the Speaker of Parliament, the 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 the, the failed porn uh, soft porn actor, not joking, this is actually a reality, um, said that uh, the five points that were asked of them by Azerbaijan are are okay for Armenia with a couple of augmentations uh, and adjustments here and there. Um, yet every single journalist that's asking, what are those points? What is Armenia about to agree on? Those questions are being unanswered, okay? So take it as you will, uh, our diaspora, not diaspora. Um, there is a government in power. It's about to do something major. I don't want to speculate on what it is, but I think it's the worst of the worst, okay? It's contrary to anything that Russia and Iran are trying to kind of piece together and, you know, let be. Russian peacekeepers are keeping uh, Artsakh in some kind of semblance. Azerbaijan's now going to let, uh, uh, what do you go? Iran's going to now let Azerbaijan go through itself instead of dissecting Sunni, right? Yet Pashinyan is about to do something we are not allowed to know what. Okay? That is what's going to happen. Um, yeah. And uh, what do you call it? On J April the 6th. April 6th. In, yeah. in the meeting between. Pashinyan and Aliyev in Brussels. Yeah, and just to give a little more uh, background on what you mentioned, Greg, and thank you for all that context. Um, Baku, Azerbaijan, presented a five five elements uh, that were presented to Yerevan uh, on March 10. The only the, this report here from uh, Azatutun says those include, among other things, to your point, Greg. We don't know what those other things are a mutual commitment to recognize each other's territorial integrity. What does that mean? Because we know Azerbaijan doesn't want to recognize Artsakh. We know that's not happening. So what does that mean exactly? Uh, we don't know, to your point, Greg. Um, and yeah, so they're supposed to meet and we'll see what comes from that. Hopefully it's not the worst of the worst, uh, like you're saying, Greg, so. Right. Um, further to the point of what's going on in Armenia, um, in the Armenian section of that the news we're covering. Uh, there's the uh, meeting of the foreign uh, ministers of Armenia and Turkey now, right? So this, yeah. we got the, the Azerbaijan thing going, and then we also got the uh, normalization and the opening of the borders between Turkey and Armenia proper. Again, 
That uh, on March 14th, they met. That okay. happened on March 14th and seems to be that it's coming into fruition that uh, Armenia will normalize ties with uh, the Republic of Turkey. Again, one of the major, major tenants of, uh, it was said, one of the- I won't. Yes, yes, thank you. Uh, one of the major kind of roadmaps and political, you know, aspirations of the Pashinyan administration. Um, I really don't know at this point who can support this man, uh, because if anyone wants to understand what are the economic, uh, 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 what do you call it, uh, additions or improvements to Armenia that will happen, just look at the uh, 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 country to the north, which is the Republic of Georgia. Republic of Georgia has been with open borders with Turkey for its entire existence, post-Soviet Union, and its GDP is nowhere better than Armenia's, okay? So at the bare minimum, let's take that as an example, okay? Uh, at the worst part, there are parts of Georgia that are completely owned and operated by, by Turks, which is what they can do. They have money, they have economic uh, uh, substantial power to do so. And once they, you know, uh, start entering into the Amer Armenian public uh, private sector, uh, I don't know. It's something we haven't been in. It's, it's, an, it's an area we haven't been in yet. So right, I right. can only see the worst. Right. It's oh, it, it's, it, it, if, when that happens, it's, I give it less than a decade. Less than a decade. And, there's, and, there's, and we might as well not even fly the, the three color flag anymore. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't, I mean, I don't mean to be, I don't mean to sound like a complete defeatist, but let's be real. If, 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 if it gets if everything gets normalized, and we we've just had reports that Turks are buying up property, isn't that right? Um, I mean, it, it less than a decade, and they'll just own it, and Armenians I, there will just I, be like, ah, I've been impoverished, ah, I need the money. I see, I see what's I, happening with Armenians, and this is just a commentary at this point on my part. Um, happening with Armenians is kind of like I'm a little bit critical of the Greeks our, our cousins to the other side of Turkey um, they had a serious situation go on with them as well in the early 20th century and I remember just the other day I was in San Francisco at a Greek restaurant and a Greek guy was serving me and I kind of said hey I'm Armenian we had a, a always very very good you know uh, feedback once an Armenian to, says to a Greek I'm Armenian likewise we like each other blah 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 and then I think it was my father or somebody at the table asked, like, you know, what do you feel about, you know, the, the relations between Greece proper and the, the, the gentleman, he's from Greece, like has an accent and all that, you know, like probably our age, you know, somewhere in, the, in his early 40s. Sorry, David. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, very early uh, 40s, yeah, early, very um, very early. And he like, and he and he said, you know what? Three who days cares? in, Greg. He, he, he said, well, "Who cares what happened a hundred years ago?" Okay. Um, I did not just then go on to my whole like blah 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 yeah, blah blah. Yeah, that, that's cool. Why don't we just raise the Parthenon? How's that? How about we just raise the Parthenon? What have? Well, why do we care what happened two thousand years ago? Why don't we just remove yeah, it brick by brick? Why don't we put it into a British museum and sell it, see if he's singing the same effing tune? Greg, I, I'm actually curious how you responded to that. Perhaps anyway, no, David. Right, I, my ahead. unfortunate the response was that you know I was in a positive place and I've been barraged with these kind of Davachan statements from my own Armenians, right? So when a Greek says a thing like that to me, like. I'm just gonna, you know, have my moussaka and just, you know have some wine and try to continue on, um, especially when it's like a quick interaction like that, like it's a server to right, 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 me. Sure. You know what I mean? Sure. Um, but it's sad. It's sad. Um, however, however, that to happen to an Armenian is even worse because Greece, unlike Armenia, had a war with Turkey, where actually a lot of Turks lived in Greece and they were excommunicated out of uh, out of the greek lands uh greece actually you know pummeled a lot of things that the turks did the navy is still threatening uh turkish navy right now keeping them in check the the greek air force is always flying kind of you know reconnaissance around the greek islands right so it's not the same uh, and also greece did not go through a genocide okay uh genocide that was uh, there to essentially uh, uh, annihilate them from the Turkish lands. They had what they're called uh, a war and then the population exchange. You could look that up. This is, this is, you know what I mean? So we are a genocide nation. Genocide, though. Many, huh? 
many, many Greeks were killed during the Armenian genocide. Yeah, but I think to Greg's point, David, the Greeks were collateral damage in that. They were, yeah. they were, they were, they were, they were cleansing the Middle East of Christians, and they happened to get caught up in it. But Armenians were the main thrust of that. Yes, yes. Like Armenians, literally, like Greeks had a place to go. Uh, to call Greece and majority of Greece. Right. Yes, Constantinople is a major, major part of the Greek uh, heritage and history, right? And you cannot negate that. It's important. Sure. Um, but the Greece of today has Sparta, has Athens, has blah, 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 all that, right? Um, it was, it was not a, it, it's not a, it's not an equal comparison of right. what happened right. to and our also, and also, we can't forget the Assyrians as well that were massacred. Assyrians as well. Uh, Pontic yeah, yeah. Greeks, actually, that's a, that's a better comparison with, yes, with yes. Armenians. Those are Greeks that were north of the Armenian highlands. Those yes. got somewhat genocided and displaced as well. Anyways, bottom line is this. When Armenians are going to start this normalization conversation, understand that you're a moron, Okay. And you're okay with anything right. that happened to your ancestors a hundred years ago, period. Right. That's you what I got to say to you, you, you anyone that wants it. You can't normalize with people that want you dead and, and will not recognize the past atrocities. And you can't have peace conversations like Armenia and Pashinyan are being forced into essentially. Or Our, Pashinyan or, is not being forced into. Our, Pashinyan's forcing Armenia, me, you, and Richard into it. Yes. That's what he's doing. Yeah. Yes. But, but what it seems like is because after these attacks, these fresh attacks on Artsakh, Pashinyan's clamoring, okay, 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 let's have peace talks with Azerbaijan. How are you going to have peace talks when they're literally attacking and killing your people right now? Well, just, I mean, the only thing is, the only, my only response to that, David, is, is that, and, and all three of us have been very vocal critics of this man and his policies and where it's led us. So I'm not trying to make any apologies, but I, I, I the, the devil's advocate in me says, well, it's because the cities are being shelled. It's because people are being killed that they want to squ- that he may want to squash this. Now, I can't speak for him, but I, I think he's giving away the farm for no reason. I mean, other than... I, I, I suppose I, other than there's there's ongoing uh, acts of aggression and he wants to stop it or somebody wants to stop it. I, I think we all should. But um, but I think it is unthinkable to to lose the long game for this. And, you know, and I, I see that 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 there's plenty in our own community that are absolutely willing to to win the short game and lose the long game. And that's a that's a big problem. That's a big problem. And we need to fix that. Like not just the three of us, but all of everybody who's listening and everybody who could possibly listen to this this podcast. So, so um, again, I, I agree with what Richard's saying to 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 a degree, right? I really think that Pashinyan is a horrible actor, is a bad bad player in the Armenian history, and history will show itself. And basically, I'll say this, guys: day by day, on March eighth, Artsakh gets cut off from uh, uh, the gas pipeline. Okay, and the and Armenians start to freeze. Uh, Azerbaijan then starts shelling Artsakh, and in, it was, I believe, six days into it, we heard something from Pashinyan. So you know what I mean? Like, it's, right? He, he said it's, it's really going to be a humanitarian disaster. That's what he said. It's going to be a humanitarian disaster. Okay, like we got to prevent. But I mean, like, why do I need to hear from you six days later and not on day one? I don't need you to give me a solution immediately, but at least say, uh, Yerevan knows what's going on. I mean, like, am I supposed to like explain how a, how a leader should talk? Yerevan knows what's going on. We are implementing uh, all possible remedies to alleviate the freezing nature of our toxies. Currently our Yerevan is sending X, Y, Z. None of that any of us heard, okay? Instead, I would like us in RH Media to highlight the ones that do something, so like Anna Svataturian and her foundation, Kuiriks, uh, All for Armenia, and other French uh, uh, groups on the very most grassroots level that started fundraising on Instagram and other uh, social media and buying electric heaters. It wasn't yet ever. It was these organizations, and I really want us to kind of continue uplifting their voices because while this madness continues, they are the ones that are doing something on the ground, and I commend them for it. You know, shout out to our former guest. Uh, Anna was always with us. Uh, uh, Shant uh, Charchaf uh, in, 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 in Martakir. This man literally started buying uh, 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 gas canisters and giving them to guys that were literally in villages that five minutes before were shelled by Azeris. Okay? 
So this is what I think the diaspora, when people say, Greg, David, Richard, I'm helpless, what to do? Identify the, the ones that are doing something and- Point them there. Or and, uh, yeah. yeah, and help or them. them. That's right. it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Either, either, either donate or amplify what they're doing, sharing what they're doing. Uh, and if you, if you can, go there and help if you can. And um, I, David, I don't want to commit you to anything, but I'm, I'm hoping in the coming days, uh, we can work together to, um, uh, you know, to clean up some of our links and really highlight on the link tree um, where those places are. And we Absolutely. can promote our link tree and have everybody just go there. Absolutely. So, yeah, right. Some of them yeah. are there already, but absolutely, yes. Yeah. Okay. Again, yeah. I'll, yeah, we, we, we've had Anna of the Anna Sosaturian Foundation. She literally has been she's uh, on fun, there. Yeah, she's fun, on there as other fundraising people. for, for, uh, and, and, and it seems like the fundraising is similar. It's, it's two things that I see people fundraising for it's heaters, and then it's, uh, what do you call it? This, uh, essentially, these packs for our so soldiers in Artsakh, which have uh, uh, like a combo pack of uh, first aid necessities that they can have. Um, right. Um, yeah, right, Oof, guys. Oh, I, I feel like, yeah, there's always so much, man. Um, yeah, well, yeah that's uh, welcome to the world of being an Armenian, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and we are entering April, so I wish we can kind of amplify the need to continue, continue the uh, uh commemoration of April 24th because that is going to become and is always an important milestone in our struggle okay yeah. uh i want us all to each and every one of us to take it upon ourselves to amplify the voices of arts off because um that really does hamper down the things that uh pashinyan and ankara and baku are trying to do that's my opinion right greg i want to i, I want to offer up a little shameless self-promotion for a second if i can yeah um <laughs> And this is the first time I've gone pub public with this, and this is the first time I've said anything about this at all openly. Um, but you know, this year, April twenty fourth falls on Orthodox uh, Easter. Uh, maybe not, you know, the one that we typically celebrate, but you know what I'm saying. It, it falls on the Orthodox Easter, uh, which, as many of you know, the Easter is about the day of resurrection and celebrating that rebirth. And for everybody who's listening, you know, we all know April 24th is a pretty heavy day for most of us. Um, and for the past two years, I have been working on a project that I am really, really uh, just over the moon with excitement about sharing. Um, I'm going to be starting my own coffee business uh, beginning on April 24th, because what a better day to bring rebirth to the world as an Armenian, but on April 24th. Um, and so I'm starting with a little friends and family business, uh, you know, uh, hang. Um, I'm literally going to be making Armenian coffee on a bike. I've got a beautiful, uh, like three wheeled cargo trike that I've built out. Um, I'm working with an Armenian coffee roaster who owns a, you know, his own, you know, he's the oldest uh, coffee roaster in town. And, and so that I found in Sacramento. For in Sacramento. Yeah. So I have an Armenian coffee roaster. An Armenian-owned business providing an Armenian coffee to make Armenian coffee on the streets. Um, more news on that really soon, but I'm really excited about it, and I hope um, you'll join in this new venture. So, you know, I, and this is really, you know, just to, to, to speak to your point, Greg, that even on small, little levels, um, we are all trying in our own ways to help bring up the discussion. Because you can only imagine how many discussions I'm going to have on the street. Is this like Arabic coffee? Is this like Turkish coffee? Well, let me tell you a little bit about that. And I've got, you know, Armenian flags all over the machine. Um, I'm, you know, so I'm going to be out there promoting Armenian culture um, via a, a very important it's, part yeah, of our culture. And, and, and David and I have been privileged enough to see this process. So this will look like he, it's not exactly uh, Richard on a tricycle, right? No, this is a very elaborate machine that he's been working cool. on. Uh, you know, uh, and it's a very cool concept of which I have not heard any right. yet, uh, which is like essentially like a mobile solution to the coffee shop situation, which is eco pretty, pretty cool. It is uh, eco-friendly, um, very eco-friendly. For sure, it's people-powered. 
not a truck. Yeah. It's people powered. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, no, it's and, very and, cool. Rich. Know, you, it's beautiful. It's magnificent. It really Richard, is. Yeah, Richard is the, you know Mr. Sacramento, so I think he's definitely going to be the one that can pull it off. Yeah, I wish you. I wish you the best. I think you it's do. a it's a, great, it's a great it's, it's a great idea to launch it on the day that you're launching it, um, and uh, wishing you all the best. We will plug it more as it keeps coming out. Yeah. Um, in the meantime, I really, really hope that this could be a good segue to ask all of the Armenians and all the committees out there to make sure that this year we do commemorate and celebrate and and uh, uh, continue the stories of our ancestors uh, regarding the April 24th, um, because it's very, very, very important for us to make sure that our events continue to be loud proud and that we continue speaking about what happened in 1915 on april the commemoration, the commemoration yeah. in the bay area will be at mount davidson cross in san francisco at 2 p.m on sunday april, april 24 20. yeah uh, perhaps uh we'll book it to sacramento right after that rich to come celebrate with you man uh yeah. the of, and i'll oh, and i'll oh, show you and i'll show you um all the digital assets i have like the website and the social media platforms all that, which is being built out right now but the first thing i needed to do was get my proof of concept together and really bring it to market and make sure that i don't fall flat on my face it's, uh, but, it's but really just cool. to, just to further but i i've been making armenian coffee at the armenian food festival in sacramento for more than a decade and so this sort of was spawned from that um, so it's not like um, I've never done this before. I'm just really grateful to be able to, do, to be doing it in this way and at this specific time, you know, so I'm just really grateful. And the name has a tremendous amount of meaning and I'll unveil that as we go as well. So anyway. Yeah. David, there's something that uh, I've seen kind of also coming down the pipeline and you are very excited about it. I know that there's something happening here in the Bay Area. Why don't you let us know about it? Sure. Uh, sure. So this Sunday, uh, the Bay Area official Bay Area premiere of the film Songs of Solomon uh, will be Sunday night um, in San Francisco um, at 7.30 p.m. It's going to be at the Regal Stones Town Galleria on 20th Avenue in San Francisco. We'll, we'll share the link um, on the feed. It's also already on our link tree for tickets. Uh, this film is about... Uh, Gomidas, uh, the the so such an influential Armenian figure, the composer, the composer of our uh, divine liturgy, uh, church um, divine liturgy music uh, is Gomidas. You know, he obviously during the genocide, uh, very very difficult, um, difficult is not the right word, uh, tragic um, history that he lived through. Um, Greg, correct me if I'm wrong. I believe he was driven. Uh, insane uh during into madness the yeah man yeah he's driven into madness and what is komi does known he's a vartaped which is essentially uh, yeah. a celebrate uh monk uh with the level of uh what do you call it a scholar so that's what a vartaped is otherwise you could yes. just be a you know you could just be a monk or you could just be celibate mm -hmm. but a vartaped is a special title in the armenian church what yeah. uh, komi does is known for is for bringing and essentially going village to village and writing down the uh, what do you call it? the 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 songs of the uh, of our you know uh, everyday folk songs right because uh, it was the, the gramophone and the, and the folk music folk music yeah yeah uh, because otherwise you know Be lost. It, it would have been lost forever well right? no 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 I wouldn't I wouldn't say lost it would have been strangled out of us yes yes absolutely. Um, and, and you know when they uh, when they when they and on a, on a side note, you know they, they they said that he went mad because of because of what he saw during the genocide. And let me just yeah. say that that I can completely understand how that happened. Like at first, I thought that was sort of like this academic, like I didn't really make the connection. But then, as I sat in my own room and I sat here with you gentlemen and broadcasting every day, every week, and working really hard just to get the message out, it drove me to the point of madness too. You know, and, yeah. and I can't I can't put myself in the same league at all because I didn't see what he saw. But I yeah. know in my bones, in my, deep into my into my bones, I, the, the, that 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 level of anxiety and fear and frustration and knowing that, you know, something and are trying to do something about it. And the world seems completely impotent to do anything about it with no will. And so. If I were in his shoes, I can, I, I, all I'm trying to say is I, I think, I think I understand as much as I need to know, to know why he would go mad. Yeah. yeah. 
And uh, I, I, hear, I hear good things about this movie. Uh, David, let us know when again yeah. is it going to be. It's, so it's Sunday, 7.30 um, at the Regal Stonestown. The, the filmmakers will be here. The producer, Osko Akopian, uh, who was here for Emil Giesen's film, uh, 45 Days. I got to meet him then. Great, uh, great guy. He's producer of this film. He was also producer of 45 Days. And the director uh, will, will be here. Um, the director is, his name is, I'll tell you right now, uh, Arman Nishanyan. He one one cool fact. Arman Nishanyan was producer of my cousin Michael Gorgian's latest film called Amerikatsi. Yeah, uh, which so is he, you, David. You mentioned it's about the uh, yeah. the the repatriants into Soviet Union from Syria and Egypt and other yes, parts of the Western world into into Armenia. Yeah, into uh, Armenia. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's Soviet I mean Armenia. the stories there are so deep. Yeah. Um, I think a uh, major story that's echoes Armenia's uh, experiences uh, it's the yeah. Jewish story of Dr. Dr. Zhivago that's a similar yeah so in, in that things. film and not to not to confuse anybody but Amerikatsi my cousin Michael Gorgian actor writer director producer he, that film was entirely shot in Armenia he shot it entirely yeah. in Armenia uh, and Armand Nishanyan who's director of Songs of Solomon was a producer on, on my cousin's film but Armand will be there the director and the producer will be there there'll be a Q&A after uh, the link is already in the feed and it's on our link tree um, so people get tickets uh, let's make sure to support this premiere um, and then we, this is one, one more thing I'll, I'll plug because uh, I have a lot of you know kind of friends um, that uh, that had you know uh, we here at Arash Media, we kind of consume information and we thank a lot of these new digital outlets that I'm seeing pop up. Um, you know, there's the newest one, 301, uh, uh, that is a network that's coming up that's doing a lot of good digital outreach. A big shout out to, you know, Anna Kachikian and the Armenian Report. We can always see that platform elevating. Uh, Zartong Media, of course, is doing their thing. And uh, uh, I see that these platforms are becoming more and more professional, which is awesome. Um, and a friend of mine just told me that there is another uh, uh, news outlet that just popped open and they're going to be uh, now uh, essentially uh, uh, kind of solidifying this news outlet and it's called Ora, Ora Gark. Um, and it's kind of a, you know, there has been a little bit of an issue that's been ongoing with Osbarez. Osbarez, obviously, we source it as well, um, as well as Radio Free Europe. Um, but Osbarez uh, has had a, a couple of like infightings and not going into that uh, 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 as a news item. But um, essentially from that, as we typically do, there's kind of a new, uh, a new news outlet on the West Coast and it's called Oragark. Don't worry if none of you have heard of it. It's a super, super new, uh, new, new, uh, new uh, entity, and we will definitely hear about their social medias and everything. I welcome as much voices uh, as I can, uh, because the more we kind of bring uh, to the forefront, and the more we educate, and the more we explain and uh, uh, engage with the diaspora, I think the better Armenia will be. Um, I'm just this is kind of like my final say, uh, because, you know, we need to kind of stay united on the Artsakh beat, on the recognition of the genocide beat, on the salvation of Armenia beat and, uh, you know, helping of all of the Armenians. By the way, there are going to be Armenian refugees coming out of Ukraine as well, because there's 100, 200,000 Armenians there. Yeah. Um, and and sadly, uh, there's Armenians fighting and, and dying in the Russian army as this is happening. We have, Ukrainian army, yeah. we, we have three more things really briefly. Um, I want to mention uh, so, something, uh, David, you wanted to mention uh, the, the, the Shushi um, Memorial, and then let's get to some good news uh, to, to, to wrap. Um, so uh, the, the thing I'd like, like to say is, is that um, there's more on the table that we haven't really talked about because we just don't have enough time to go through it all, and we don't want to keep you guys here all night. Um, but it is very important that you reach out to your senators and reach out to your, uh, to your representatives. And if you need to know how to do that, reach out to us and we will help you do that. I know I will personally do that. And the reason I say that is because um, what's on the table right now in American politics, they're, they're ready to cut the, the budget to Armenia um, by almost 50%. Now, if you remember Biden, what Biden is, the fiscal, Biden fiscal. Is. that's right. So just prior to the the incursion and the the theft of Artsakh, 
um, the Trump administration boosted the money going to Azerbaijan and cut the money going to uh, Armenia. Um, so you can only imagine where this could possibly lead us. So without re-inflaming all, all of the news again, let me just say this. It is imperative that you interact with ANCA, yeah, that you interact with um, the Armenian Assembly, and you push in every direction that, that you can to help uh, prevent this from happening, because it is bad news for everybody. So if you need to know how to reach out, reach out to us, and we'll help help you do that. Yeah, and um, the links are on the link tree. Uh, that's well. right. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Okay, so David, um, you, you wanted to talk about uh, Shushi real quick? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's important that, that we mention, that we discuss it uh, and, and commemorate. Uh, the Shushi massacres occurred 102 years ago from March 22nd to March 26th of 1920. Um, and, you know, obviously it's a very uh, tragic part of um, the history of Armenians living in Soviet Azerbaijan at the time. Um, and Greg, if you have anything you'd like to add to that, I mean, um, yes, the obviously it's a super important because the the whole idea around sushi being like a Turkish blah 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 blah. This was an Armenian city. This was a uh, is an Armenian city, uh, uh, and this is the more this is the heart of Artsakh. That is why it's now becoming the Turkic uh, uh, national whatever blah blah blah. Yeah. Um, it's because it is. The, the most hurtful thing to do to Armenians is to make that non-Armenian. And the reason why Armenian Shushi in Soviet times was predominantly Azerbaijani is because Azerbaijan populated, is because of the 1920 massacre that was uh, committed against the Armenians of Shushi. And that is what you saw as a tourist, as a visitor to Shushi when Shushi was in rubble. We thought that that was because of the war. And it's again, us not propagating the right information. That is not because of the war of 1992. That was the remnants of the massacre of 1920 when the entire Armenian population of Shushi was murdered. Okay, it was murdered and, 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 and it was the continuation of the Armenian genocide. Okay, yep. that's how it went down. Right. Yeah, thank you, Greg. Thanks, Greg. Yeah. Oh, did Greg uh, drop off momentarily? Okay, well, that's all right. Um, let's... Um, did we lose Greg? I, didn't I think we did tem temporarily. So um, let's uh, pivot to you said you, you, we, we had a couple of good good news articles, if I'm correct, or at least we can talk about them. Yeah, there was uh, something, uh, you know, I think it's cool. I don't know. If, I don't know. I guess it's positive, but it, I think it's something that's cool. A new leopard was found in Armenia. And like a, a new breed, a new species? A, a new leopard, yes. So is a new leopard was identified in a camera trap footage by the Foundation for the Preservation of Wildlife and Cultural Assets in Armenia's Caucasus Wildlife Refuge. So uh, they, they captured a male adult leopard, which has been compared with only other male recorded in the area and confirmed as a new individual. So uh, that's, cool. see, that's very cool. Very cool. Uh, they're calling it Neo, the resident male leopard of this habitat. Has been captured. Was been captured. Is he the one? Uh, yes. And let's see. I'm looking for the name of it. Uh, Is it Keanu know. Reeves? Uh, <laughs> no, there's a there's a type. I think there was a name of the breed. Uh, forgive me. Um, not prepared to say that offhand, but we'll definitely. The link was will be in the feed for sure. No but it, it's very very. It, it was something I thought that was very cool. Uh, um, and something that's a departure from the doom and gloom news that, that tends to come up. Uh, hey, you know, it looks like Greg is having some internet issues, uh, yeah. so he is not going to join us for our, our closeout. And, you know, it far be it for me to, to say anything about internet issues. You know, we uh, some months ago, we interviewed William Bayramian, and I had been looking forward to that for months. Uh, we were all in negotiation uh, trying to put it together. And then, of course, the day of, I had a catastrophic computer meltdown. Uh, including a little bit of language from myself. Um, but at any rate, um, so uh, Greg, uh, reboot, reboot, control, all, delete, whatever you have to do anyway, but uh, we'll, you know, so, um, you know, so maybe, maybe this is the right time to do this. Uh, yeah, David, we're, we're, we're going to have everything, uh, new links up on the link tree. Um, we're working on um, a more stabilized schedule. Thank you so much for, for being a part of tonight's broadcast and for, uh, not only listening at, and what watching afterwards, but telling your friends about it as well. 
Um, you know, we're three guys who are working hard to bring you as much, um, you know, salient news and do it in a digestible way and have some reasonable dialogue about it. Um, because as David and Greg could tell you, when they started this, the whole, the whole point was to uh, export information to the diaspora in a way that, um, that we just weren't seeing before. And so hopefully um, that, that mission is being accomplished. So, yeah, well, um, well said, Rich. And, and just to wrap up that point about the leopard, because I, I figured this out, it is not a new species. It, it's, a, it's an existing species that is on the verge of extinction. And this wildlife refuge found another, another male of that species. So this is very positive news because essentially what it's saying is that this Caucasus wildlife refuge, refuge is effective in conserving um, the, this, this species. So here's, here's the big question. Do they have a male and a female? Uh, that I don't know. This, uh, because this, otherwise, we're you know. Right, right. Hopefully, there's some females in there. We're just circling oh, the train on there, yeah, you know. Yeah, but. Right. <laughs> well, hopefully, there are. the The link will be there, and uh, try to be funny. Yeah, I'm probably not. No, I know. I know. Uh, it's a good one, man. So, <laughs> yeah, Rich, thank you, and thank you everyone for watching. And yeah. All right. Well, thanks a lot, everyone. Uh, thanks for paying attention, and we will see you the next time. Please remember to stay. Stay focused uh, on your lives and do everything that you can, not only for your families, but for the community at large. And if you can, uh, remember uh, to check your email periodically because news about when we're going to be doing shows will come out there. Also, stay tuned on, our, on the social media platforms, uh, and we'll do our best to keep you abreast that way as well. So uh, with that, I think we're, uh, we're going to wrap it up. All right. Share, share, share the page, share the, right. share the videos, uh, share with friends and family. And and uh, thanks so much for following. All right. Have a good night, everyone. Good night. Oh, wrong button. <laughs>